Nikki's loved ones are alarmed at actions her fiance Bobby has been taking in the immediate aftermath of Nikki's disappearance. Some of his behaviors that didn't sit right with the family were, from my understanding, he had pawned her ring. He had tried to get the money at the deposit back on the wedding. It's only a day or less since she's been missing. No one knows why she was missing, so that's certainly something that raised a lot of suspicion. When Nikki disappeared, Bobby was doing everything he possibly could to get money. He was trying to cash checks, her rebate checks, her student loan check. The Richmond PD is also focusing on Bobby and brings him in for questioning. Bobby was given a polygraph test and the examiner's determination was that he did show deception on relevant questions to the investigation. I'd like to believe that Bobby didn't have anything to do with my mom's disappearance or didn't know anything. People grieve differently. I often wonder if someone he knew may be involved in my sister's disappearance because my sister and his family didn't get along. I thought maybe it was someone close to him and he was trying to protect them. There was a letter written to my sister prior to her coming up missing and it was from a family member of Bobby and it threatened her and the letter said specifically I'll see you dead before this marriage happens. She showed it to me, she showed it to the pastor, she showed it to everybody in the family and the letter disappeared. Three and a half months after Nikki disappears, there's a break in the case. The car that Nikki was driving the day she disappeared is spotted in a parking lot at the Meadows of Catalpa apartment complex in Dayton, Ohio. Nikki used to live in Meadows of Catalpa. And at the time the vehicle is found, Steve, the father of Nikki's daughter Peyton, lives at the complex. Did I ever think Steve may have played a role in her disappearance? Yes, this ran across my mind. Mysteriously, in Nikki's car, investigators find a laundry basket full of her folded clothes. Detectives are also trying to figure out why the car would be in the parking lot of the complex where her ex-boyfriend Steve lives. Nikki and Steve did not have the, the best relationship, but she did try to stick around for Peyton. But in the end, she decided that it was best that they split. Steve will tell you himself that he did not treat my sister right and that he abused her. We were never told or never seen her car within those three months when we were searching over in the apartment complex. It just kind of, to me, felt like whoever did this was just trying to set my dad up and make it look like he was the bitter ex. But my dad passed lie detector tests with flying colors and he definitely cooperated with the police, no questions asked. He volunteered interviewing, DNA testing, and was cleared. The vehicle was brought back to Richmond where they did DNA swabs and nothing was found from that evidence gathering. With detectives stymied by the lack of forensic evidence in the SUV, they turned their attention in another direction, to one of Nikki's co-workers at the prison, another prison guard named Tommy Swint. Tommy and Nikki's relationship, I think, started off as a friendship and someone she kind of looked up to, but he had this obsession with her, this really weird obsession. Tommy would get a kick out of seeing Nikki around the facility. So whenever she said she needed something or wanted something, here you go. He would sling that credit card out. And we told her, don't take it. You cannot take that man's money and spend it like that. Because if you do, he's going to want something later. On her bridal shower, I remember him sending her some lingerie, which I thought that was kind of weird. Like if this is just your friend, why are you sending her lingerie? I can remember an incident. I stopped by her house. When I got close to the door, I heard some screaming. Instead of knocking on the door, I just went on in. And Nikki's sitting on a big, like, love seat. Her foot is in Tommy's chest, and he's leaning over, and she's like, help me, he's trying to rape me. I said, get off my sister 
and he started chasing us both around. And then he kind of chuckled and said, oh, I'm just playing with you guys, and then he left. I always wondered, what if I wouldn't have walked in there? When Tommy became a person of interest, they had already eliminated Steve. I believe that even though Bobby failed the polygraph examination, that they had pretty much in their minds eliminated him. So I believe Tommy was the only one. When Tommy was named a suspect in Nikki's disappearance, it put all of our minds into overdrive. We came up with so many scenarios. During the investigation, when the investigators were trying to speak with Tommy, they always described him as being evasive in his answers. There's several questions that he answered, but he wouldn't go into a lot of detail. With no evidence to hold Tommy Swint, the case stalls, and there are no new developments for authorities to pursue. Not having any solid evidence against Tommy Swint was very frustrating for investigators. It's frustrating for the family, and you want to find a suspect. You want to pinpoint that person. I felt like they were onto something, but somehow he was able to elude them, and I don't know how. We get to 2007, and Nikki McCown's family learns some information that makes them very upset. In nearby Charlotte, Ohio, Tommy Swint has been sworn in as a police officer. I was totally, totally, totally ticked off. How could some man that is a person of interest in the disappearance of a woman become a police officer? I picked up the phone and called the detective and told him what I had just heard. I was furious. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that he was able to pass any type of background check. We immediately contacted Trotwood, letting them know that he was a major person of interest in the Nikki McCowan disappearance, which they were not aware of. Tommy is forced to resign from the Trotwood Police Department. At that point, he decided that he was going to sue the city of Richmond. Tommy Swint and his lawyer put it out there that they had never been told that he was a person of interest in Nikki McCown's disappearance. Richmond police, of course, dispute that and say they did tell him that. In fact, everyone they talked to in the investigation is a person of interest. Tommy's lawsuit is eventually dismissed. What that lawsuit did was raise Tommy Swint's profile in the community pretty high once again. And in late 2007, Dayton police got an anonymous tip. But the tip isn't about Nikki's case. It's about the murder of another woman. Tina Marie Ivory was 33 years old when she was found in 1991. Just a little bit west of Dayton in Jefferson Township, her body was wrapped in plastic bags and then wrapped in a blanket with tape around it. They took both blood and semen samples from Tina Marie Ivory's body. They also took some fingerprint evidence from the tape that was wrapped around the blanket around her body. However, at that time, they had no matches. Dayton investigators are eager to obtain Tommy Swint's DNA, so they reach out to the Richmond PD. We received a call from the Dayton Police Department from an investigator telling us that Tommy was a suspect and that she thought that maybe our investigation into him with the Nikki McCowan disappearance could possibly benefit her in her investigation. 